ever. <laughs> like, you know, from the beach. And, um, but he disappeared. And I realized that I had an encounter with, with something. It was, my heart was just beating. I thought something's happening and I'm not sure what. And I went back home. And that night I just said, God, if you're real, I, I want to know you. And that was my introduction to just this light that just filled me. I was, I knew something had changed and I was a completely different person. The next day I was just bubbling and chatty and laughy. And, um, and so from then on, it was a journey. I did feel that as I read scriptures, the Lord would speak to me through scriptures. Like I would just open the Bible, start to see things and go, oh my goodness, God is speaking to me. I never really heard I never perceived what the voice of the Lord was like until probably my 20s when I had a profound encounter with the Lord and the Lord actually physically manifested himself in my right ear uh, <clears throat> and took me simultaneously into a vision. I was, I was out in a trance for about two hours and um, he spoke to me very clearly and said, you're going to, I'm going to speak to you and you will speak what I tell you. And so I realized then, you know, because he said, I've called you. I've called you to hear my word and to speak it. So that was my first calling um, audibly. It was a real audible experience and a very visual experience. So that is my experience now with the prophetic is that I tend to feel, see, and hear. And it does. I'm not always really sure what I saw first. I have to kind of think about it. <laughs> um, it's like virtual reality. <laughs> <laughs> like a movie. But isn't it it's interesting as well uh, with the spiritual realm? Sometimes you don't always like you can hear through seeing, right? Yes. It's like your vision communicates a million mm -hmm. words already. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoops. wow. That's yeah. so powerful. So when you were in the ocean, um, that person who spoke to you, mm -hmm. you're not sure. Was that a person or an angel? You're not sure. I think it was Jesus. Wow. I'm convinced it was Jesus because he said I would have to come and save you. And I realized that day was my day of salvation. So I didn't, I think he made himself like an ordinary young man because he didn't want to startle me because I definitely wasn't particularly perturbed by his presence, but I felt like I could trust him, which was profound for me at that time because I'd had a lot of wounding from particularly male figures in my life and i felt so at peace with him there so i think it was jesus um Aww. but i only realized that after it's like oh my god you were there wow. so yeah you know izzy honestly whenever i look at you or hear you speak it's like i really feel and see jesus like i get this reverence that that i'm actually talking to jesus and I mean, I know that Jesus in you, you know, it's not saying like I worship you, but, exactly. but you yeah, know, exactly. I mean, I understanding of the personality mm -hmm. of Jesus. And so what was it like to grow into that revelation that you could now hear his voice and you just mentioned you, you felt called to, to hear him and yeah. What's your journey been like from that time to now? Okay. Well, it's interesting. I try to kind of think about it so I could say it in very um, concise kind of bite-sized pieces. I think my first phase, if you could call it a prophetic phase, was just this instantaneous boldness to speak. So I would be in a meeting and I'd feel, oh, I need to get up and say this. And because we were leading the meeting, I had that freedom. So I would go up, prophesy, speak, and I was very bold. And then that was my first phase. That seemed to wear off and I went through that <laughs> trial full of trial kind of phase where I had to really push beyond the intimidation things like I would go onto stage 5,000 people there and the microphone would be shut off so I'd be mouthing and nothing would happen it they were just consecutive very unusual and horrible things that happened which really confronted me and made me feel like are you going to keep speaking or are you going to push beyond this and I, I pushed through some of that stuff. And then sometimes I would, you know, I would just withdraw a little bit and go, oh, okay. Uh, maybe it's not my, so I started to second guess. That was a really difficult time. Started to second guess the voice of the Lord and started to think maybe I'm just trying to do this. 
and it is it was a long quite a long period during that time no one had called me a prophet or anything i didn't call me a prophet um i would have people saying yeah why do you keep getting up and it was kind of challenging um but i guess that's all part of the growth period of understanding that i felt i mean i asked the lord i said you know how do you love knowing all these things at one time he said well because he said knowledge is great knowledge is not love he said you can know a lot of things it's just like 1 corinthians 13 but he said um love is greater than all that and he said my love is greater than all that and i realized in all of that that was my journey to learn to love which is um continuing it's not that's not a short phase i think that's a whole life phase um so yeah there was some of it and we could probably go into the other bits as we go on <laughs> yeah wow knowledge is not the same as love mm -hmm. i love that um, what would you say are maybe like your top three dreams or like sort of like maybe right. a vision that you, you, you have currently for okay. the body of Christ, uh, a dream yeah. you have for them. Right. That, yeah, that you've been steward sure. kind of keeping if it's not too personal. Yeah, for sure. I think probably not an order of importance, probably my, I get really excited when I hear people going, oh, I've been prophesying, I got it right. So when I see other people stepping out, I feel very proud. Like I get very excited when I see people that we've been stewarding and helping through the prophetic to see them get up and do it is my greatest joy. It's like seeing your own kids kind of perform on stage or do something you just want to tell everyone hey, look at them they're doing amazing you know they're my kids or even though they're not really my kids uh -huh. it, you feel that you're sharing in their journey of development so that makes me very happy i'd like to see more of that and i love to see it when they get super bold and take more risks um my other dream which is probably the a more heart dream is to um this and the last one that I say will probably help this one, but this middle one would be that there's been a real separation from uh, different kinds of prophets. And so they get pigeonholed really fast. For instance, um, case in study would be the psalmists are not, not necessarily all psalmists are prophets, but definitely the ones that are. Sometimes people struggle to hear the prophetic through that song because they're going, oh, they're just singing. They don't realize that that's a prophetic operation is very powerful in sound. And so David was a psalmist and I believe he also was a prophet king. And he, dis he displayed the power of rulership and government through the area of sound. And I think my dream is that the nations would see that more and more. So we could hear the psalmists and we could acknowledge them as prophets all around the world. I know that some are, but some of the ones that I think are less seen and acknowledged i think i would love to see that happening and in that i think in that dream are a lot of lot of little dreams which is to see the prophetic dancers to see prophet performers to see the rappers be able to come on stage and be able to rap the, the word of the lord and for the church to be able to this is going to be trickier i feel like the world will hear it before the church will uh, i feel the world's ears are less critical and less narrow and so i think they might hear it before the the church does before the the greater body of the church does but i think that the rappers the singers the dancers that whole prophetic thing being able to make the theater of heaven wow. visual the earth i think is my dream my real dream that we could actually have performing artists that are that yielded to the spirit that they can actually work together and create the live theater of god's word so i think it's going to be i would love to see it out outside of the walls of this beautiful building <laughs> um and i think um, that's my biggest dream to see that happen live and probably my last thing would be the thing that you started with paula which is to really see the body of christ um not have the separation anxiety of are we acceptable are we not acceptable that there's just this um we're totally one with Jesus, that unified glory of Jesus just be manifest 
because I think that's really going to bring much more, not only credibility to the prophetic, but it's going to make it more powerful and um, more impacting. Could you unlock a little bit about the unity with Jesus? Because I know it's something you guys really yeah. do hammer on grace and the gospel. And right. honestly, Izzy, like, I don't feel like it's really theologically taught as much. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, sure. Could you unlock the gospel the way that you see the gospel? Right. Okay. Share the gospel with us. Yeah. Well, share the gospel. That's easy we might just get saved yeah, again. We might just get saved again. Well, so um, you know the everything that we see in the covenants leading up to the new covenant are always um, types and shadows. So you know, because you can't speak about the gospel without speaking about the blood. So if you had to say what's in what's in my veins right now, what's keeping me alive is blood. And um, the life is in the blood. So if I had to bleed to death right now, I literally bleed to death. So there, when you have no blood, you have no life. So Jesus actually is the, Jesus is the manifestation of what actually binds a covenant, which is through the blood. That's how God has made this. And so he will only relate to people based on the recent covenant. And the covenant through Jesus Christ is the last covenant it's the new covenant but it's also no other covenant coming after this that's why it's called the everlasting covenant um and that's what was prophesied by so many of the prophets as i you know they said you know he's coming to make an everlasting covenant with you israel and so the old covenant was actually created to show us that we could not possibly fulfill everything that god required and everything that was required in order for us to be um you know show ourselves approved we couldn't we all fell short of the glory we all as as you know and so what they would do is okay everyone's sinning so the high priest is going to offer the blood of an innocent animal he's going to go into the inner room and then he's going to go into the most holy place and on behalf of the people and on behalf of his own sins you read about this all in hebrews 9 10 11 the whole of hebrews is magnificent on this but the, he, the high priest would go in and bring the, the blood sacrifice so that the people could be um, wiped clean of their sin. But that could only happen once a year. So you just think about it. People were living in guilt. They knew they'd messed up. And they were storing up. All the sins were storing up until they could all make the, the trip to the high priest, purchase the offering, and then the high priest would go in and with all the bells so that he didn't die, so that, you know, if he did, that you could drag him out. But he would go into that place that no one else could go, which was a proper place, you know, and then offer up the sin and uh, sin offering. And then people would be clean, but just for a little bit, because, you know, as, as they would leave the town, you know, one would slap the other one. It's like, oh, no, we're going to wait for a whole nother year before we can be clean again. So there was a continual separation from fellowship. There was no way people could actually feel like they were not condemned. So imagine living with continual condemnation. That's, that's actually how some, of, some believers even live. It's horrible. So my, my, my absolute uh, passion is to free people from that thinking and say, okay, it tells us in Hebrews that Jesus came as that high priest and not, he didn't enter the temple that was made with human hands. He entered a temple that was outside of creation that was not made with human hands. He entered that place and offered his blood up once and for all so that we completely cleansed of every single sin, past, present, future, which sounds ridiculous. So people go, well, that's blasphemous because that means you never have to say sorry. And I'm like, no, of course, you come before the Lord and you confess and you say, Lord, I'm so sorry. You confess to your closest friends and you say, man, I messed up, whatever. But that's to keep ourselves vulnerable and in fellowship. But the actual gospel, the fact that Jesus Christ went into that most holy place, he didn't just go there to cleanse us from sin. He made us so that we can be like him. It says that we have just as much as we died to sin, as we are raised up and as we live in him, we've been recreated to be the actual righteousness of God in Christ, which is, whew. 
It means that we have access to the unlimited realms of fellowship with Holy Spirit any time of the day, not just once a year. It means that we have access to the Father the same way Jesus did. Like Jesus said, I only do what the Father's doing. So how could he not give us access to that? He's given us access to what the Father is doing. So you can be in that realm of worship, know what the Father's doing. Jesus can have fellowship with you. You can be partaking of his joy. It says that right now he's anointed with joy above all his brothers. So if I'm ever lacking in joy, I'm like, Jesus, I'm right here. I'm sitting with you. You've got so much joy. I need that. So I can be filled with joy. <laughs> and not only that, but Holy Spirit is continually, because he said, I've come to live in you. I've come to not only be with you, but to live in you. It means that you have this continual baptism of Holy Spirit. You can pray in the Spirit. You can be supercharged. I mean, at any given time, there are four of us. So how can we, you know, that's amazing. That's the living creatures right there. You know, you are living in a place of being supercharged. And that's, I think the gospel makes you so powerful that we need to share this inheritance. You, it, you can't do it by yourself. It's too magnificent to be by yourself in it. And so that's why he says this, this good news has to be shared. And this good news has to be understood by being in relationship with other people, which is the ecclesia, the brothers, brothers in faith. Wow, that that will do. Like, I'm like, that's just, that's like everything. Wow, you mentioned about um, accessing, you know, God and, and always having that access. How do you, um, and, and I love that you mentioned separation anxiety because I feel like that's really significant, um, especially like with shame and condemnation often coming right. into our life when we trip up, you know, or when we sin. Right. And I guess I just wanted to ask a follow-up question with that separation anxiety of how do you usually deal with mess or even in your own life when you have made a mess or you've hurt people, not intentionally, because I think right. oftentimes we don't even do things to hurt people intentionally, but people cool. are very hurt. Um, I know in my own life, that's true. How do you deal with mess and, and sort of shame, actually? Shame and yeah. condemnation. I'm sorry. I'm asking you deep and, and hard. No, questions, but... no, I no, I love these. These are my favorite type of questions. I think they're great questions, Paula. Um, I think the first thing is to see that shame and sin are actually, um, you know, like if you had to stick two pieces of sellotape together, they're kind of stuck to each other. So if we have, if, if Christ suffered for our sin he also removed our shame because shame is the consequence of sin don't forget that in the garden you know when it was when they realized that they were naked they were filled with shame and they had to cover up so shame tries to cover up sin whereas i find like um i find the best thing to deal with shame is to just confess i'm like i did it i'm so sorry like if someone says to me, or like recently even, like, you know, sometimes people say, you hurt me by doing that. And I'll go, even if I don't think I've done that, what I say is like, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. Because my, my heart is that you wouldn't remain in that place. So therefore, I'm not ashamed and I'm not going, oh my gosh, I own all your problems. But what I am saying is, I own the part that, I may, that somehow my, the memory of me has made you feel this way so that neither of us are in shame. Because sometimes we can own other people's things and we can feel ashamed. Do you know how you go, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and the person goes, no, but you really hurt me, so I'm not gonna forgive you. And then you go, oh, well, now I've got shame. I don't believe in that. I believe that when Jesus has actually taken away your sin, he's removed the shame of anything that you have done or people perceive that you've done, and therefore you are innocent. But you don't tell them, no, I'm innocent. I've never hurt you. You say, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And I want to I wanna feel your suffering. Uh, this must feel awful. I'm so sorry that you feel that way. Or if you've really hurt someone, you say, I'm so sorry that that, oh my goodness. Um, so I find that being really humble and vulnerable without taking the shame of anybody else is really helpful. Because that way we also keep people accountable for them to remain free. Because all of us have to keep, if, if Christ has died for all our sin, then how can I hold you to account? Imagine if right now you just said to me, 
I think you're awful. I think your curly, your curly hair is silly. I never want to talk to you again. Um, and then I was like, oh, that's terrible. Now, Jesus has forgiven everything. So how can I hold anything against you? I would have to go, we're all free. Because Jesus has literally carried every single sin. And so whether I've messed up or whether somebody has hurt me, I have to deal with it the same way. And that is he has paid for it all and therefore there's no debt. So if someone wants to hold a debt, I feel sorry for them because I'm like, I'm so sorry for you because that debt doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so I can't wear it. I, the shame cannot stick to me. Yeah. Does that help? Wow, that was so powerful. I think it's almost like we need to always remind each other every day that sin has been dealt with. Because sometimes it's like shame can kind of creep up in our emotions. You know how like, like right. even like a lack of love for ourselves. I don't know. For me, I think that's been the journey. So vulnerable, but like that's the journey I've been on. It's like, it's easy for me to love others, but I think I'm very harsh with myself. And when I make a right. mistake, I can't accept it. Like it's like, right. Allah, and I beat myself up. And it's so hard to kind of, rise above that and um right. <laughs> can you can you relate in any way yeah. with, with sort of like not being hard on yourself as a pastor of a church and, and as a leader of this yeah. movement um and, and how to kind of like watch yourself to not fall into that um self-critical yeah. like critical absolutely. spirit you know absolutely I mean, look, I have to be honest, I've had to, I've, from time to time, I've gone for counseling too, because sometimes you get deeply affected by um, accusations and things that can come, and especially in the prophetic, because sometimes people say, you know, well, why didn't you see this coming, um, or whatever, but I think the main thing for me has been that I can't wait for somebody else to make me feel good about myself. I can't even wait for my husband to make me feel good about myself, so uh -huh. I have to, and I have to be able to wake up every morning and he's not the one who's going to drip feed my system. Cause I think self-esteem is a drip feed thing. You can't just go, I'm going to tell myself this and it's going to last a week. It, you have to wake up in the morning and go, thank you Lord that you're loving me right now. And because you're loving me, I'm at peace with me. And I get out of bed and I've had times where I've gotten out of bed and I've been, I forgot to do that thing yesterday. I forgot to contact so-and-so. I didn't do that. Oh, beep, beep, beep. And the Lord says, get back into bed. Change that thought. Don't get out of bed until you are okay with you. And I go, that's cool. Okay, I'll do that. Then I get out of bed and I'm like, it's okay. I've made three mistakes and that's actually okay. The world's still spinning and everyone's going to be okay. <laughs> you know. And then the same thing at night. I go to bed and I go, are there any debts that I'm holding? Nope, not against anybody and not against myself. And the Lord says, good, good night, sleep well. And that's how I start every day, end every night. I can't do any other way. It's really simple. Wow. I often find that I feel sometimes like in the world, non-Christians deal with failure better. Like they fail and they're like, I failed and I'm sorry and they move on. But I feel yeah. like in the church, it could be like a religious spirit that comes and almost like, because shame says you are the, the bad thing you did. You know, guilt says you did a bad thing. Yeah. Shame says you are the bad thing. That's, that's right? true. And uh, so, yeah, thank you for, for shedding light on, on how you cope with, with messes. Yeah, yeah. And also I go back to Jesus because I mean, if he suffered for the sin and the shame, then I don't want to make his suffering a waste of time. I go, Jesus, I want to apply what you've done every single time. And I, every day I think about it. Every, it's not like I have to, oh my gosh, I need to go back to the cross. It's like, well, we continually carry that in us. That's what it means to take up your cross daily. It means be completely aware of the fact that some things are just dealt with. They're just done. Even if it's a struggle, I think Jesus doesn't mind the fact that you are struggling because that's what it means to work out your salvation. It, it means, oh, I'm still working this out. It's still coming out of me. And sometimes you have good days and sometimes I go to sleep and I go, well, that was a, that was a bad day, but tomorrow's a new one. You know? <laughs> wow. How do you deal with rejection? Oh, I'm not good with that. <laughs> 
I like people to like me. <laughs> I think athletes have the most noblest job in the whole world because you literally become a mom to thousands and you risk getting hurt over and over again, right? Because you're yeah. called to love and feed the sheep. <laughs> yeah. How you doing? Sheep she bites fight. sometimes. Sheep bite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you know what? I, I had to deal with something recently and this is what the Lord showed me. It felt like, a, oh, I didn't feel understood. Um, and I was driving and, and I felt the Lord say, can you imagine if I had to vacuum clean every bit of salvation and you had to see everybody in their pre-salvation state and there was no salvation, there was nothing made available for any kind of like no presence, no nothing. And I just felt this horrible darkness and sadness. I said, oh, that's horrible. And then, and then I said, but Jesus, you loved us in that state. So when I come back to that, I realize no matter how much people reject you, or sometimes they're rejecting, they're actually pro um, projecting onto you their own rejection many times. Oh. They're not really rejecting you. They're just disappointed in themselves. And they want to test that love and they want to say, well, you've disappointed me, but actually they're really disappointed with themselves. So I go, okay, if you loved me in my pre-love, in my pre-Christian state, you loved me while I was still a sinner. You loved me when I was dead to you. Then how can I not love now that I'm alive? So then it feels like the black and white goes to full color again. And, you know, without God's love, nothing makes sense really. So I need to be self-loved before I expect other people to love me. <laughs> wow. I'm taking notes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I need, could you say that again? I need to be. Yeah, I need to be loved before I can expect other people to love me. You know, it's really hard. Like, in other words, rejection feels worse if I'm already rejected. But if I'm loved, the rejection is only, it's like, it's like if I have an account that has no money in it and the bank tries to take a bank fee, even that small amount seems ridiculous because they phone you and they say, um, there was no money to withdraw the bank fees, which is $10, you know, but if my account has, you know, $2,000 in it, if they try and withdraw $10 of rejection, <laughs> let's call the bank fees rejection, sorry, banks, um, then then it, it's not going to feel like much when you compare it to the $2,000 of being loved. So in other words, if I'm receiving the love of God so much that my account is, in, is, in, is it full, um, then that small withdrawal when someone rejects me doesn't feel as bad as if my account is really low, then that rejection will have. So if I'm feeling the rejection stronger, the Lord will say to me, oh, you need to be loved up a bit more. You need to just come and sit with me you need to meditate on these scriptures because you you're forgetting that you live from another another um a realm where there's more the supply is much more hmm. wow hmm. you know you remind me a little bit when you said about loving yourself and I wanted you to maybe unpack that a little bit more more specifically how to strengthen yourself in the lord you know, in the midst of, I know we're like in a crisis right now and there's a lot of even racial discrimination happening. Just right. feels like there's a war in the world, you know, like it's like very interesting times that we're living in, you know, virus, hatred. I think even nations are sort of coming against nations and yeah. Um, yeah and I guess my question would be, I know Bill Johnson talks a lot about one of the main things he would tell us as a school is um, he would say, uh, he'd always tell us to learn how to strengthen yourself in the Lord right. and that being yeah. something that brings you through the hard times because you can do Bethel school ministry and you can get burnt out or you can, you know, you can still walk away from the Lord. You can be a pastor and still, yeah. you know, walk yeah. away from, from the Lord. And Absolutely. so, my question is, Absolutely. how do you strengthen yourself in the Lord? And what, what is that to you? Kind of, or even like, what, is, what helps you 
in the midst of yeah. crisis and hard stuff. Okay. I am ruthless with myself. I'm not harsh with myself, but I'm ruthless in that if I start to think, oh my gosh, you made this mistake, this is terrible, I stop myself right there and I start to pray in the spirit instantly because I'm thinking this is a bit beyond me and the arguments are subconscious and then I'm starting to talk to my conscious. So I start to pray in the spirit because that feels like my battery is being plugged into the wall because if I, if I allow that to go flat, then you know, I can drown myself in 10 minutes uh, in negativity. So I don't, I'm ruthless right at the start. I'm like, okay, you're, you're not even going to go down that road. Um, I don't wait for somebody else to pull me up on it. I have to do it myself first. Um, that's the first thing. Then I pray in the spirit. And then I go, okay, well, I'm not just going to pray in the spirit. I'm also going to think about something that God has spoken to me. So I will go to the most recent thing that he's been speaking about. And it's like, I don't know if you've seen this with toddlers, but if a toddler's having a tantrum, you, you can sometimes distract them with something that's really fun, something that they used to play with, that they remember, and it's a very distraction. So I find the word of God is my greatest distraction tactic. I take the word of God, and even if it has nothing to do with my situation, that's irrelevant. It's still an exciting thing for me. And I go, oh, remember what the Lord said there. If he's speaking to me from, I don't know, Psalm 122 about Jerusalem being this, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem because she's becoming a, a very populated place. I'm like, yes, yes. And I'm starting to think about something completely unrelated to my situation. Because sometimes when you focus on that situation, you just make it worse. So I find a great technique is God will say, right, pray for the situation. It's completely unrelated to you now. Let's focus on that for a bit because that's not the main thing happening. And I find that really is good because sometimes when people try and encourage themselves by doing war and facing the enemy, I felt the Lord say, help people to focus on me and not to be unaware of the enemy schemes, not to focus on the enemy schemes and not be unaware of me, not the other way around, you know, focus on the Lord, worship him, um, make him the main thing. Don't be unaware of the schemes. And that's just on the side. Yeah, the enemy's got schemes, but it's not the main thing. Um, and then I just worship. I think if it's really getting bad, <laughs> I just worship. And, I've, and I've, sometimes I'm worshiping and I'm crying. And it just feels like the song is really bad. I'm playing all the wrong notes. And, uh, you know, but worship actually, for me, fills that space in my soul that is either um, experiencing the memory of trauma or the memory of something having happened it feels like that the realm of my soul is flooding with the presence of God. And so I, I have never come out of a worship time discouraged. <laughs> and I think that's probably what David did at Ziglag, you know, because I mean, everyone was accusing him and saying, we don't have our wives and kids and livestock because of you. It's all your fault. And so he was feeling the pressure of like, oh my gosh, it's true. It's my fault. So I think when he went and encouraged himself, he worshiped and he said, God, I don't understand what's going on. It doesn't make any sense. We were doing your work. And now I'm getting into trouble for that. So I'm just going to worship. And I think when you magnify the Lord, he magnifies himself in the situation and everything else gets smaller. So the magnifying glass is like looming in front of us and all we can see is the Lord magnificent. Ah, oh, you know, and then everything else, it just seems less important. So that's how I strengthen myself. Some of the ways. And if that doesn't work, I put on loud music and I dance. I love that so much. <laughs> Guys, check out their YouTube channel. I listen to it every day. I don't know. It's my cup of tea in terms of encountering the like worship music. I, I just love, I love Jubilee. Like, I'm like, Lord, I wish they had like a million albums out. <laughs> like, please make more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was going to also ask about in terms of the prophetic, I know that uh, Jubilee as a house actually has such a heart for the marketplace and not just bringing the prophetic to the, the church, but outside the four walls. And maybe what's your journey been like in terms of prophetic evangelism? And then also has the Lord opened doors for you, maybe with even some influential people to prophesy over and how to carry yourself in the world as a prophet? 
Okay, look, I have to be honest, I don't know that I have had openings to government officials or the Prime Minister or anybody that would be seen in the media as to be somebody important. But I have, we have, through our kids, have had opportunity to, for instance, um, have contact with, like, um, I don't know what her name is, but she's, anyway, it doesn't really matter what her name is, but she is one of the hosts of The Voice. And we've been backstage and sometimes just the interaction of that, I wouldn't call it prophecy, but I definitely think it's when you're aware, like you're aware of their stress, so you start to pray for them. So I'm at the stage where I notice things and I pray for people. Um, but definitely I've had inroads of being able to prophesy over strangers and people in shops and being able to not tell them I'm going to prophesy, but I just tell them, hey, I really feel like you're doing a great job. And Are you an artist? Are you stepping out into something new I might ask questions and then just say to them I think you're going to do great at that new job opportunity and they just go oh my goodness you're so nice you're so lovely but it's never been like I've sat someone down and kind of read their mail and then we've had contact I've not had those kind of opportunities yet um, I had one recently where I went to collect something from Facebook marketplace for my daughter and this lady invited me in the house and I said oh I, I think you are, um, uh, where was she from, Sri Lankan? And she goes, yes, I am. And I said, um, you must be a great cook. She goes, yes, I am. So she said, I said, I'd love to learn how to cook. And she says, well, let's get together and I can teach you. So um, probably next week I'm going to have lessons from a total stranger um, down the road um, in her house because she just wants to have me for a meal and I'm going to get to share the gospel there. So I think that's a new thing for me is that Facebook marketplace could open doors into people's homes, you know? Um, Cause she was like, you're coming over, we're gonna cook. And I'm like, I can't wait to do this. Now, the weird thing is I'm really not a fantastic cook at all. I love to bake, but I'm not a good cook, but I know that we're gonna have conversations about Christ and I'm excited about that. So, yeah. I love that. You met I'll her. You, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> yes, tell us, Facebook marketplace is how you met her. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love your courage to to go and, you know, just meet her and that sounds so fun. That sounds amazing. Isn't that an amazing idea, guys, to um connect, you know, by the, as the spirit leads. I think it's so important to always think how we can bring an, another person to the Lord, you know? Like when you're in love with someone, you can't stop thinking about them and you want everyone to know right? The love you right. have. And I don't know, sometimes I feel like we leave evangelism to the evangelists and we leave prophecy to the prophets, but it was right. never meant to be that way. We were all meant to evangelize. We we're all meant to prophesy. Right. So, yeah. I love that example that you're giving us that, you know, and even if you're a pastor, it doesn't mean you've graduated from sharing Christ, you know? No, that's right. That's right. And I think when I go out and, you know, I ha I'm just doing chores or doing different things that I have to collect. It's often for kids because we have six. So there's lots of birthdays. Um, but I think, you know, um, I just felt the Lord say that prophecy isn't telling someone their future. Prophecy is actually encouraging them, strengthening them and comforting them to make them feel that they're completely acceptable to the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit. You're illuminating the possibility of them seeing the Trinity. That's predominantly what we're there to do. So prophecy is to love people, strengthen them and comfort and encourage them to such a place that they can actually receive more of God. It's not necessarily to read their mail because some of us don't approach people because we go, we have no information. God says love is greater than information. When the door of love opens to a person's heart, you can read their mail after that. There's no limit to what you can see. And I think we're in tr what we see in public ministry is not always how it happens. Like we can't call people out. Do you know what I mean? We just go to people and we say, man, you're doing such a great job as a mom. And they go, really? Well, you've just prophesied into their lives because they'll never forget that. The next time they push the stroll and they think, oh, I'm a lousy mom. They go, no, I'm not. Somebody just told me I'm a great mom. And that's a prophecy. I didn't have to know anything about how she mothers, but I had to see her struggle that she doesn't really think she's a great mom. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to open it up to questions from people in the, in the group. So if you have a question, could you write it down on the chat room or I can call your name if you raise your hand 
Um, does anybody, yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand. You think you can raise your hand on the Zoom thing? There's a raise hand button. Or you can ask on the chat room if you don't want to be seen. <laughs> David, go for it. Hi. I was wondering, what is your process for writing your songs? How do you compose your oh. worship songs? Okay, um, I, I hear rhythms really clearly. And because I hear rhythms really clearly, then that helps me with the syllables of words that I want to use. And also if I hear the rhythm, it helps me with the type of song I'm going to write. So it's going to pretty much dictate where I'm going. Um, I, I write almost every single day, so it's a habit. Uh, I try and write words down or, pat, or patterns down or I go around with my phone and I just put it on voice memo. Um, if I get a, you know, so I have a diverse way of writing, but mostly it'll come from a rhythmic, something rhythmic that I want people to move to and I can imagine it or I can pe feel people being moved by a particular gentle rhythm. And then that starts me thinking, oh, these, this is this kind of pattern of syllables, these kind of words I'd like to put in. And oftentimes it'll come from just being with the Lord. I just, I'm in his presence and I'm like, ah, oh, I can hear this, you know, this pattern. That's how it often starts, but not the only way. So do you, do you, sorry, follow up question. So do you do a technical way of writing or is it like just hearing from God and it just comes out naturally? Like for, like even for slow songs, like worship songs, um, is it more on technical or more on the you know, getting inspired and? <laughs> letting the Holy Spirit bubble up so, or sometimes it's that way like it's like yeah. an inspired song exactly I think it's both but I think initially when I started songwriting I was always waiting just for the inspiration until I felt the Lord say inspiration is a habit and you need to cultivate it and so I realized oh I can actually switch inspiration on I don't have to wait for it and so I it's like inspiration is the switch and then I get into the technical. So I can decide to write a song. But what I have noticed is the song that's birthed out of an encounter with the Lord will usually have a much more deep impact on people than something that I just decided to write. Like I can write, I can write anytime. I can write a good song, fairly good song. But the songs that people tend to sing a lot are the ones that came out of encounters where they can feel that something saturated that moment and it seems to hold something different. Yeah. Can you sing one of your um, famous songs, like one of your <laughs> no. most popular? <laughs> even one, even one line, just one line. That's most sung. Oh my goodness me! I don't know what's most sung recently, but probably the one that's um, right now somebody's just put on YouTube. It's a whole um, choir from uh, in Ganda. It's the uh, we lift our hands. To the great I am, who was and who is and is to come. And that the whole choir did a most amazing rendition of that recently, and that was super fun. I'll wow. give the link to Paula and, she, Paula, and she can pass it on. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Wow, Izzy, did you take voice lessons? Because you sing so well. Um, I did for about six months. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. And I was, um, so I, I'm not very good with my vocal um, exercises. Sometimes I get a little bit lazy, but I need to brush up again. <laughs> um, yeah, but I did do vocal training. Yeah, did. Vocal training. And you also play keys in the piano. Yes. Uh, yeah. That you've been playing for, for a really long time, huh? Um, probably more from when I was 18. So I was a guitarist before that and then decided there were too many guitarists around and I met Finn. He was a guitarist. So I just thought, let's bring variety. And I just um, I started doing piano more seriously. Yeah. Wow. If you guys don't know this, her entire family leads worship. Like her, mm -hmm. her husband, her son, her daughters, right? They, I think they could all sing. Yeah. And not yeah. just sing, guys. They like sing like excellently like i'm like mm -hmm. i get like a holy fear of the lord when i hear them sing <laughs> like, oh my god god is coming like wow. there's something about excellence that really brings the glory mm -hmm. of the lord like i mean you see it in the world like you watch you know america's idol and you feel you can actually like feel the presence of god 
and they may not even know God, but their excellence opens up a realm in the spirit where you're actually seeing who God is because they're made in his image. And so I just love the excellence, Izzy, that, that you're, that you're, beautiful family carries and and i love seeing like tana now in even in the music industry and i just watched her yeah. her her uh her pro- they produce the uh video music video yeah yeah so yeah. good yeah it was awesome it was awesome so you must be so proud yeah larissa go for it are you still okay um izzy for just a few more minutes yeah of course, I'm okay for another 10. Yeah, eight to 10 minutes. Yeah, good. Perfect. All right, sure. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you more on how do you disciple your children in terms of like what activities do you do? Um, what are the things that you actively and um, say to them or declare to them? Our own kids? Yeah, Our your own, own kids. Yeah, yeah, my own kids. Okay, yeah. Um, we, um, I mean, there's ones that I probably pray more regularly with the younger. And so we get to experience God more and we get to talk more. I think my youngest, he's 14 and, uh, we talk probably the most. And so we'll talk mostly around, um, how do we hear God? So I think I spoke recently at the youth and it's things that we've spoken about as kids uh, to the kids is just the fact that how they hear God is not you know, one sibling hears this way, the other one hears another way. One of our kids said, I, I can't hear God unless I'm out in the ocean. So I said, well, go to the ocean every day. Like, don't ever skip the ocean, you know, um, because for them, the ocean is where God connects with them. But for the other one, they hate going to the ocean. They like to be warm. They like a fire burning. They love books. So they connect with the Lord, you know, through reading. And so we've actually encouraged the kids that they're all so diverse to not try and be like anybody else, just be like themselves. And um, whatever, whatever is the primary connection that the Holy Spirit has with them, to start with that. And then that's usually where the Lord will help them to, um, to just stay connected and feel like they're okay with the world, you know. So that's one of the things is just celebrating who they are. And the other thing is just to also help them with just discipline. Like, you know, um, whether they feel like it or not. I know it sometimes just feels like routine, but one of them likes to read the Bible. The other one likes to have it on audio. So um, they have a routine where they, every day they have the audio Bible on at a certain time. And then in the night, you can hear them for like 15 minutes. They're just praying tongues, you know. So it's encouraging all those different disciplines that they have. And they all do it at different times. And they all do their own thing. And the other one doesn't want to be heard when they pray in tongues. The other one is loud as anything, you know. So again, it's celebrating their diversity and helping them to feel that if they want to discuss something, they can, but I don't ever force it. I don't ever say, have you done your devotions? You know, I'm not like an in-your-face mother, but I do, because we are so excited about Jesus, it's a natural topic. Um, so we talk about our dreams. That's usually the first thing that happens. Is, I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night. And then they talk to each other, and we're learning how to interpret one another's dreams. And we also are very honest about our failings. So... I will be very real and say, I really stuffed up there. Because they, they call me out on stuff. They say, mom, you said that and then you did that. And I'm like, yeah, I was wrong. I'm so sorry. I totally did that. I totally did that. I don't make excuses. I just, I call it out of myself. So if I say to them, hey, that was really not okay. They will, they're quick to say, yeah, that was really not okay. I'm so sorry. So that develops in them. They, they follow your example. You know, if you're vulnerable, they'll be vulnerable. So, yeah. Amazing. Um, I, I want to ask another one, if that's okay with you. Um, are we still okay on time? Yeah. Um, so how do you reconcile um, God's promises to you? And um, for one, when, things, when the promises don't come in a package that you expected? And right. another one, when... Um, there's so much uncertainty that you don't know if um, you're just going to let go of those things or just keep holding on and just like, yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, that's a great question. I think um, disappointment happens because we can't tell the difference between promise and God's presence. 
so when a promise becomes greater than the personality of God, then that promise has to actually bow down and take precedence. So I make some of the dreams that I've had that, you know, I've had dreams of dance schools. I'm turning 57 this year. I still haven't seen some of my dreams come to pass. And, you know, I keep telling the Lord, Lord, my body's getting older. I was way more flexible, you know, 30 years ago. Like, when is it happening? You know, but the Lord's always shown me like, exactly like you said, like the package of the promise is not going to unfold the same way that I think. And so my kids are all dancers. So that's part of the promise unfolding over my life. And also the fact that um, he's always more important to me than the fulfillment of something because he is my fulfillment. So in other words, the presence has to be greater than the promise always. And as soon as the one goes overshoots the other, I have to tell the promise, hey, bow down. The promise is never greater than the person uh, because he doesn't owe me anything. So when I see that, I'm going, look, you don't owe me anything. I'm obviously not getting my timings right, but we're going to enjoy the process. So I find if I'm not waiting for something, usually I realize, oh my gosh, there's way more promise in now than in the future. So that's my second thing is promise has to fill my now and it can't be something in front of me. Promise has to be, in other words, if I'm, if I'm believing for a child, I have to start waddling like I'm heavily pregnant way before the baby's out there. So I have to walk as though I'm a big fat mama before I have kids. You know, I have to actually go, I'm actually pregnant right now. I'm fully expecting, I'm fully expecting. <laughs> yeah. That makes me enjoy now instead of keep waiting for something that I feel God still owes me. Does That's that help? amazing. Wow. That really helps a lot. Thank you. Astor, can you pray for us to have a psalmist anoint? Can you pray for <laughs> us to have a similar anointing as you like to, to compose? So? <laughs> a lot of, yeah, can... a lot of us here are very creative, like Wonderful. creative artists, yeah. singers. Yeah. yeah, let's release like a, a, a glory anointing of creativity. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you, Holy yeah. Spirit. Is, is this how we're going to end? <laughs> Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence right now. You're so beautiful. You're so colorful. You're so diverse. You are the tribes around the throne. And we thank you that you are so blessed by the different nationalities and beauty of ethnos, the different families that are around your throne. And I thank you that all these families represented are around your throne, Father, around your throne, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we thank you today for an impartation of free access to everything that you want to show them, that they will Amen. throw off anything that would stop them, that they would never, ever allow a limitation to settle on their soul on their emotions or on their minds that in jesus name we just thank you for a spirit of freedom a spirit of Amen. liberty that would just continuously run ahead of them and play like a child around them and invite them to a place of enjoyment of your presence because we thank you god that as children of god as sons of god we are the most creative geniuses on the planet and father Amen. i thank you that each each one would that you you would help them to be disciplined in their craft that they would practice their craft that they would come before you and offer everything that they have before you lord that you would multiply it and so we thank you for that a spirit of wisdom and revelation to come yeah. upon their giftings that they could multiply yeah. that and take it to a whole new level we thank you holy spirit we have access to what you're showing us to what you're revealing to us and so we thank you that that takes us way beyond the natural realm into the realm of supernatural ability. Amen. I just Amen. release that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Jesus name. Woo! Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yay. Wow. I can feel that. Izzy, thank, thank you so, so much for your precious <laughs> thank you. Such a pleasure. My God, if you had more time, we probably would ask you a million more questions. <laughs> I'd come back. You can invite me for a part two. <laughs> yeah, can we do that for a part two? Do that. That, that, yeah, that, for sure. that would be such a treat. And you really have such a mother's heart. And 
I really, I really admire your heart to equip and empower the body to walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, thank you, yeah. Paula. It was thank wonderful you. being with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can we have like thank a quick you. question? Like, um, when are you guys opening back again? When is Jubilee Church going to open its doors again? Ah, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure because the, at the moment they still have that 50 um, limitation. And so the people that are here are all the um, leaders, the people that actually make the media and stuff, because that's like 15 of them. And so this weekend, I still think it's continuing that way. There'll be about 50 people with social distancing. And then I don't know what they're doing after that. But if you watch the news, you'll be able to see. And you'll definitely watch on our website. It'll say opening up again. It'll All be right. a big announcement. <laughs> huh. awesome. I think Cecilia wants to. Um, I think she has a meeting to go to. Is you have a meeting? You have a meeting? I do. I do, Paula, only because it was a pre, because remember, how, I don't know how I did this, I made a mistake thinking it was 10 o'clock, so I thought, oh, 10 o'clock, and I made all my meetings, and there was some that I couldn't change, so I'd already changed this one meeting yeah. twice, but um, I could probably do one more, though, I could probably do one more question if it was. I think, uh, some, so sometimes what we do is we like to give, like, encouraging words to our speakers in the end, um, like, we we practice prophetic words basically oh yeah but we sure. want to be sensitive if you have a minute we'll we could do the minute um yeah if you so do that, i can record this is that okay yeah yeah okay just let us know all right cecilia you can sure. give a prophetic word and if anybody else has a just a quick short sweet word um go for it so first i saw two 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 and then another two Celia, okay, um, um, louder, your voice. Louder? Yeah. I mean, I can't hear Hello? you now. Now is better? Yeah, can I can hear you. Hear you. Yeah, okay. You, or I need to go on the other, maybe, because this is in, uh, what's it called? It's no, back. that's good. I can hear. I can hear. It's good. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I saw, first I saw two, Three times two, and then four times two, and so Revelations twenty-two two, with the tree of life uh, next to the river of life, and then it became a key and a key and and but you and you got oh you got a ma and you he gave a and um, well, a hand came with a key, and then okay. the key immersed into your hand. You received the key into your hand, and that is a master key. And then I saw this, the scripture of Isaiah 22, 22, which is, the, uh, I gave you the key of the, um, the keys, where, and then the doors will be open, where no one, no one can shut, and, and the doors Wonderful. will be shut, no one can open. And so Wonderful. this time, wow. you already stepped into this new thing, and in the, into the, oops, into this tree of life has to do with that scripture so they're like jumping wow. like a rainbow next to each other their goals wow. on the uh, each side bless you wonderful wow What's thank you so much <laughs> thank you leaves of healing for the nations that's a proud, powerful word right there yeah Wow, I just got Ephesians 3.20 for you, that God's going to yeah. do more than you can ever ask or imagine, Izzy, that this is a mm -hmm. year of favor. It is really the year mm -hmm. of jubilee, where debts have been canceled, where, you know, slaves mm -hmm. are free. But I feel like jubilee, jubileant, mm -hmm. you're going to become a center for the nations to experience jubilee. Like, I feel like the Lord said, wow. promotion is coming where what you've been stewarding in the secret place is now going to go into the public, but that there's mm -hmm. protection and he's fiercely, there's angels protecting the reputation mm -hmm. and the, and the covering and the, okay, this is a risk, but it's almost like, I feel like the Lord is exporting the goods mm -hmm. of the house. <laughs> and, and, and I know that, that like, 
it's like you're very happy to just keep it in the house, you know, because it's really good stuff. But I feel like the Lord is, is it's like uh, Abraham, you're going to be bring salvation to the nations. And I really believe like, I don't know if you're going to be like in television speaking or that the music is going to like go all over the world. But I just feel like the Lord is going to make you guys famous for bliss and grace and joy for bliss. <laughs> um, but like, <laughs> you're a happy prophet, Izzy. And then we need happy prophets. And I just pray right now that there's going to be a microphone magnifying the voice of the Lord that's on you because you carry and hear the voice of the Lord. And there's many modern day prophets rising up, even little prophets, like young prophets, international young prophets. And they're looking for mothers and fathers to look up to and understand what are they seeing? Why am I seeing these things? Why am I having visions and dreams and there's so many seer prophets rising up and and i feel Izzy, that that you're like a mother in in the prophetic world you know in in the world of, of sons and daughters so wonderful thank you so much paula awesome thank you yeah just so good. Word. okay go lars <laughs> yeah <laughs> just i'm gonna try to be quick um um i i just see the line of judah over you just um just a roaring boldness and even even um a leadership anointing over you yeah awesome i, I have one short that. one yeah. <laughs> go for it uh, oh on behalf of the people that weren't able to thank you for your services for your heart of love to them i just want to thank you Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. So everyone is thanking you so much for all that wow, you have thank done. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. <laughs> One of these days, maybe we should host a worship master class. A worship fun. Class. Worship music. Now we have mommy. We have a new mommy again. She's a master. Yeah. <laughs> you have wow, your children you also so join much. and teach us also. Your children can teach us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Lizzie. Yeah. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Paula. And we'll see you again. Yeah. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> All right. See you, Izzy. Ciao. See you, Bless darling. Bless you. Thank you so much. Bless Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Mm. I'll just stop this. Sorry.